Our next speaker is Dr. Matthew Hall. Uh, Dr. Hall is the acting branch chief of early translation branch and a group leader of biology in the Division of Preclinical Innovation here at NCATS. Um, he will be talking to us today about COVID-19 and therapeutics, the NCATS experience. Matt, the stage is yours. Thanks, Sarita. Thank and uh, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, you know, I feel lucky uh, being here at the end of the talk. I thank you all for hanging in there. Um, and the last two talks we heard, all the talks have been important. The last two were really important because we're thinking of, you know, as we think about workshops and about the assay guidance manual itself, where we're going to be um, trying to build out on um, some chapters on um, assays and discovery approaches and best practices for antibody discovery. Um, and Mitchell's uh, helping us think about how to do that. And 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 Tim is talking to Serene about you know a, a focused scientific meeting on on uh, DNA encoded libraries the way we did uh, early last year on the Heal initiative and and the way we will do for SARS-CoV-2 early next year. So I'm really going to be focused on assays and small molecules, um, the our experience at NCATS, but but also um, I give you a bit of an update about where we stand with small molecule therapeutics because, you know, vaccines and antibodies are getting all the attention. It's just not fair. So we're going to talk a little bit about small molecules. So just for those of you who don't, who don't work at NIH or NCATS, you know, we're a, we're a part of the intramural research program and, and, and we have um, a, a more biotech like structure, even though we're, we're part of a, a, a strong sort of PI, traditionally PI aligned. Uh, research institute here at NIH. NCATS um, is we're clustered in teams. Uh, we have things like informatics, data science, um, assay biologists, automation for high throughput screening, medicinal chemistry, and 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 those scientists work together in teams the way you would see in biotech. Um, and we also have uh, project managers and and all of the contracts and and capabilities needed for late stage IND filing work. And so we can go all the way from partnering and always collaborating with people with. Um, a, a target hypothesis that they've developed through their deep domain expertise and, and collaborate with them using our translational science approach all the way through in theory to, to IND filing and, and sometimes beyond. So we're a translational science center, but we're part of NIH. Um, from a small molecule point of view, uh, we've got you know, real strength, as you can tell from the AGM in, in assay biology. We care a lot about developing and disseminating new technologies and approaches. And, and, and we can do so in theory pretty openly because we're an AH. So we have an amazing robotic screening platform. We screen normally when in 15, 36 world plates. And in fact, we usually screen in dose response, pharmacologic dose response to rank order compounds. Um, and, and, and so we can, when we think about sort of SARS-CoV-2 and how it came about this year, you know, at NCATS, we, we basically stopped doing, <laughs> partly voluntarily, part non-voluntarily, stopped doing everything else. And, and really focused on, on uh, discovery for SARS-CoV-2. And that's all we've been doing. Um, we're slowly um, returning to, to some of our, our other work, but, um, but we really wanted to respond strongly to SARS-CoV-2. And it's an interesting challenge we had because it's literally a brand new disease that, that I think November 16th, if I'm not wrong, was the first official case of SARS-CoV-2 was diagnosed in China. So it's actually been exactly one year since the first case and, and, and probably about uh, 10, 10 months of, of really intense attention and, and work in the United States. Um, and that's a challenge because, you know, we know this traditional set of chevrons for, for translate, practicing translational science, but all at the same time, every step in parallel had to happen. We had to understand the disease and the targets that are associated with it. We had to uh, un understand that biology and pivot that into creating new assays to, for high throughput screening have the right libraries, small molecule libraries, phage display, anybody based libraries, as Mitchell was talking about, and others, and work out what preclinical models were useful and appropriate for showing that, that therapeutic candidates work um, or not. And of course, as we need to create all these in parallel, we also need therapeutic options for patients. And, and so drug repurposing, became, as we all know, has become a really big part of our 2020 SARS CoV 2 response, looking for those therapeutic candidates that we can respond with. This is a great scheme that um, Carl Brimicum, who works here at NCATS, has made, and, and we've updated it as we've gone along. So, for example, um, Europylon 1 over here is, it was not there last week, but there was some strong literature last week that, that helps us agree that, you know, the spike protein, you know, needs to be matured by proteases like furin. It binds to ACE2 and, and Europylon 1. 
Um, that facilitates uh, viral entry and another protease here, Temporis 2, cleaves the spike again. And all of those are required for the virus to enter the cell, to be unpacked and uncoded, to be translated. Proteases take those long polypeptides from translation and, and mature the viral proteins that are necessary for replication um, of the RNA and ultimately complete repackaging and lysosomal trafficking and virion release or egress from the cell of that virus. That, so the, that, that pathway here you see from one to six uh, represents you know, a lot of biology and therefore a lot of therapeutic targets. Um, some of these targets we, we knew about and understood from research into other coronaviruses such as MERS that I mentioned earlier. And others um, are fairly new um, and, and, and have been you know, fairly novel biology. And of course, there's a whole human host proteome as well of proteins that the virus hijacks that are potentially druggable and for treatment options as well. So when we were looking at what to do, you know, there, there was really a, we recognition that a long-term solution and thankfully long-term looks like, you know, 18 months maybe, um, is, is eradication by vaccination. Eradication, when I made this slide, was in hindsight, too strong, but but certainly management and and minimization. There are always going to be people who can't be vaccinated who will get infected anyway or won't be vaccinated. And so we need treatment options. But but of course we need treatment options for patients straight away. That was true from from day one. Um, we didn't have those. In fact, there were no COVID or nineteen or SARS CoV two drugs, and there were no coronavirus drugs at all for treating other coronaviruses that we could easily pivot. So there was a lot of work to do, and of course. Drug repurposing represents a real a real power, and I've, we've used this scheme and, and similar ones like it to explain why drug repurposing is advantageous, and and we really need to, to to update it. You know, the idea is that you know, as we all know, for therapeutic development, going from the beginning to the end, you know, you may screen hundreds of thousands, or according to Tim, billions of compounds, uh, depending on your small molecule approach. You need optimization with medicinal chemistry. You need to show activity. You need to show a lack of toxicity. You need to be able to manufacture it. That takes a long time. It can take up to 15 years on average before you get to those clinical trials and FDA approval. And what NCATS did about 10 years ago and, and others have done since is created a library with all FDA approved drugs, put them back into a, a small molecule library. And so when we create a new assay, the first thing we do is we screen with that because sometimes there may be activity, and if, if you get activity that looks promising, you can go from waiting 15 years for a clinical trial to what we normally say is one to two years because that drug's approved and you know it's safe. And you can ask the question in a clinical trial about um, whether it really is, um, may, may show patient benefit. Now, of course, we've seen drug repurposing trials within months of when SARS-CoV-2 emerged and they continue to take place. Um, so it's, it's really showed the power of, of, of repurposing. But as we were thinking about this, lots of other people were thinking about this. And so the translational problems we identified were needing to develop assays to study COVID biology quickly, uh, needing to be able to identify therapeutic options. Um, and of course, MCATs and other screening centers and translational science um, sites you know, know how to do this. It's what, it's what we do on a normal day-by-day -day basis before this came along. And so we decided that what we try and do is, is to create assays around as many viral targets and, and assays around as many host targets that were relevant as possible, screen them against our approved drug library and sort of a larger set of mechanistic compounds and make that data available as quickly as possible using an open science approach. And so a lot of what I'm talking about today is really about how we share our scientific knowledge as quickly as possible. Um, and, and, and so we, we looked at this viral genome of the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, it's large for a virus, it's small compared to our genome. Um, but we really ticked down this box and we just sort of asked what assays, when can we create around these based on what we know about biology or that others are developing out there that we might be able to partner and collaborate with them. So all of the boxes in pink represent viral genes that we've been assaying um, and, and developed assays for. Um, we've also worked on a number of viral, uh, sorry, host proteins as well. Um, ACE2 is very popular. I'll give you an example of that. Host proteases like Tempris2, I'll give you an example of as well. And then, of course, there's, there's you know, multi-cell based assays that are, that are out there um, that we developed as well at NCATS using pseudotype particles. Uh, replicons uh, is something that we've been pursuing. And then, of course, live virus, which you need a BSL3 lab to do. We, we don't have one of those. Not many places do. Um, but we've been working with partners to to do screening with with live virus and in, in, um, and do real infectivity and replication assays as well. So this is a lot of assays, um, and it was a lot of work in parallel. But as I said, we stopped doing a lot of other science to tackle this, um, and and we wanted to make sure 
that, and we recognized that while we were doing this, others were thinking about it as well. And so we were seeing papers come out with little screens, large screens, um, good assays, bad assays. Um, and it was difficult because people are often publishing hits from screens, but not full data sets. So it was difficult to judge the quality of the, the science that was coming out. The data wasn't easily available. Um, the methodology wasn't necessarily there because there was a lot of science happening very quick. And just to put that in context, I was reading last week that there are over 70,000 papers on SARS-CoV-2 and COVID in PubMed um, in less than a year. Um, so that's really a massive amount of research output this year. And we've all had that challenge of sifting through that science to work out what's good and, and what's not. <laughs> um, so with all this data being generated, you know, and, 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 and given the limited access and availability of that data, we really wanted to think how we could, how we could gather and share data and, and the, share the data that we were generating as, as quickly as possible. And so it really came down to data sharing. And a few years ago, we, we had a program at NCATS called Canvas, where um, we, we, we were tackling a very different issue. We, we were thinking about the fact that natural products, synthetic chemists all over the United States and around the world, make it identify purified natural products, but they never really get tested in anything. They sit in a freezer after someone's PhD is done. And so we created this open source program where people anywhere in the world could send us, and you can see there were lots of places that did this, that purified natural products would create a library. And we, we screened that against over 60 high throughput assays that we had here at NCATS to share the data. It was really a pilot program to see how it worked. It worked quite well in terms of gathering and collating an open source library, generating a lot of data. We needed a way to share all of this assay data as we were generating it back, not just back to the, um, the investigator who provided the compound, but it was an open science initiative. And so we wanted to, to share it with the world. And so we created a website so we could do that where people could access all of the details of the assays to reproduce them. I don't need to tell you if you've been sitting here for two days that that's critical. Um, but also get access to the data itself. It might be useful. The data may be useful to other people and you know, for other purposes, machine learning and AI approaches, um, comparison with the, the structures of compounds that are natural products that other people are working from. So we have this platform called Canvas as a website. And so what we decided to do early on is, is as we were know, knowing we were going to be doing these assays and, and generating a lot of data, we wanted to make sure we were sharing that data pretty quickly as well. Um, in fact, as quickly as possible, and certainly before publication, we were generating high throughput screening data and just posting it on the portal, and we're still doing that. So in a week, a group of colleagues at, at NCATS um, designed, based on the Canvas page, this open data portal for NCATS, and the, the link's down here. You can, you can go and check it out, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick walk through some aspects of the open data portal before I tell you about two of the essays from my group that, that we'd, we'd had developed and, and screened just as examples that sort of, I think, reflect some of the science we've been talking about over the, the last two days. So first of all, as I said, we wanted to make sure the data was being shared fast. And, and so new data was being uploaded as, as informaticians and assay biologists signed off on the quality of the assays and the quality of the data. It would be loaded up here um, onto the open data portal. And that meant it was browsable. So you can click on the open data browser, you get heat, it's, looks, there's more assays now, it extends off to the right here, but we, we have a false color scale for the activity of in, individual compounds um, that were being coming out of screening. We, we do our primary screening in dose response, so we have full dose response curves for every compound. Um, there are about 8,000 compounds uh, in the open data browser. There's 3,000 approved drugs um, approved in the United States, Europe, and Japan, and also a lot of preclinical candidates and probes that are mechanistically defined with known targets that may point the way for future therapeutic development for SARS-CoV-2. And you can click on these and rank sort them. Um, the green heat co color coding is for um, primary assays. We have these pur the purple and pink for counter assays. And so all of the counter assay data that you've heard so much about is also loaded into the open data portal. And then you can also go and click on the, the assays. And I, I'm not gonna talk through all these other tabs, but I'll, I'll mention one or two later. If you click on assays, every single assay that you've got data for on this portal, you can click on this link, you can read all about the assay, you can read all about the protocol. In fact, when you're looking at, at, at an individual assay that's listed on this page, you can, you can click on download assay protocol and you get a PDF with a full uh, assay protocol table, all reagents listed, an overview of the assay, um, everything described that any other lab anywhere in the world would need to do to be able to to, to adapt this assay, you adopt it in their lab and, and, and utilize it. 
for, for different approaches. It may not be high throughput screening, it may be for other reasons. So the, the, the protocols are open and available. I've already showed you, you could browse through the data, but you can also click on this button over here and export full high throughput screening data sets. So we're not just making those active compounds available, we're making all compounds available. Um, and, and there's lots of good reasons that, that we've talked about today that, and yesterday that for why we would share our data in that way. You know, you can imagine that, you know, the 30th best compound might not be very interesting and it may never be published in a paper that only shows the top 10 hits. But if it's the 30th best compound in 20 different assays, maybe that's a really useful molecule and something we should be thinking about from a repurposing point of view or from a biological insight point of view. So you need full high throughput screening data sets. You need open data to make sure we're maximizing the potential of the data that we generate and, and trying to improve human health as, as quickly as possible. So um, this, was a, a, this is a slightly dated scheme, but it, it shows something we tried to do is early on as we identified assays that we were going to develop and, and we, we sort of planned this out at the end of February and the beginning of March and the, the wet biology started around the middle of March. As these assays were developed, you can see we've got a color code here. As the repurposing screen was done, the data sets were being posted as quickly as possible, sometimes days, sometimes a couple of weeks between when assays were screened and when the data was released so that it was available to the scientific community. And we were really committed to this. And as we, we developed each of these assays, the other thing that we've been able to do is receive, you know, um, I'm gonna use inverted commas here and say random, random candidates from people, sometimes from companies, sometimes from academia, sometimes from government who would say, we've got this thing, we, we think we have a hypothesis that might be useful for SARS-CoV-2, would you test it in your assays? And we'd say, we'd say they'd send it, we'd test it through our battery of assays and we'd send them back their data, no questions asked. And if that was useful and they could move forward with a, a candidate and an idea, um, and our assays were, were useful for that. That was that was a great outcome for us. So um, we did. We've done a lot of ad hoc testing of other people's candidates um, uh, over the course of this year. So the open data portal is a, a great way to share data, and I just want to give you one or two examples of, of assays that we we um, generated along the way. So this is Quinn Quinlan Hansen. Quinn's a, a, a postdoc in my group, um, and and he decided to tackle this particular one that that's of high interest for. The therapeutic development, and we knew early on it was. So other COBs uh, like MERS and the original SARS, um, their spike protein on the virion binds to ACE2 on the cell surface as an entry receptor. The biology has evolved a little bit since then, but but this this primary interaction is still true and the basis for the neutralizing antibody approaches that, that Mitchell was talking about. So um, Quinn decided to try and find develop an assay, a proximity assay that measured the binding between the spike protein and the, the ACE2 receptor. Um, there are a few sources of spike protein available. We had a, we have a great collaboration um, around developing um, serology uh, assays for looking at convalescence and, and identifying previously in, in, infected patients. And uh, Dom Esposito, a collaborator of ours at Frederick National Labs um, up in Frederick, part of NIH and NCI, um, had sent us some great spike protein constructs that he's been developing and optimizing. And so we could incorporate those into these assays um, the way they basically worked is that we, 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 we initially were using ACE2, uh, which was histagged as protein, and the receptor binding domain of spike protein, um, which is bound to an FC. Um, and of course, we know that RBDs binds to ACE2, and so that was true in solution as well, when you strip the protein off the virion and strip the ACE, the, the, some of the ACE2 off the cell surface. Um, and so they could interact with one another, and this is the interaction we wanted to disrupt. But, so we could use this... Um, assay technology called alpha Lyser that I, I think Jamie Darlin spoke a little bit about yesterday. Um, and now um, set up an alpha Lyser assay where you rely on a, a streptavidin or a protein AFC interaction um, to, on these two beads. One could be excited, singlet oxygen diffusion takes place and you get si signal or emission at a different wavelength and you could measure that. And so when you get signal, these, prote these proteins are interacting with one another. Um, there are a few reasons why we decided to tackle this. Um, one was that, as I said, we had multiple COVID-19 projects at NCATS. The alpha lysis technology is amenable to high throughput screening, so we could perform a drug repurposing screen. Um, it should be easy to execute, um, and it should be compatible with multiple therapeutic types. So, and I'll, I'll show you that, and Mitchell talked a little bit about that. So um, I'm gonna show you the data in a second, but I'd say that along with sharing the data as quickly as possible, we've been relying on preprints all the way through um, to share this as quickly as possible. And, and of course, we're trying to publish these and you can read about this. And I'm not sure whether there are many newspaper articles that, that talk about alpha Lyser assays, but, but when we posted this preprint, um, it was shown in um, 
uh, and described in newspapers like uh, the Hindu here was one newspaper that identified this essay. Um, and, and so it was quite, quite a thrilling time to be an essay biologist and have essays described in, in newspapers. Um, so, as I said, Quinn used these two constructs um, and, and they could be the basis for this Alpha Liza uh, primary assay. We needed a counter assay as well, and, and we used true hits for that. And so, when you use a true hits assay, you, you remove the two protein interact proteins that are interacting that you really care about, and you just rely on um, an assay that, that, that has direct um, interaction between these two beads. In this case, it's the, the, the biotin um, streptavidin interaction. Um, and that will weed out any positive hits that happen to interfere with excitation or emission or the biotin streptavidin interaction. And so, for example, biotin is a hit in your primary screen, but it's also a hit in your counter assay. And so you can't get too excited about biotin when it's a hit in alpha lyser assay. Um, to, de to develop this, Quinn um, and had to first find the optimal signal for this interaction of these two proteins as part of an alpha lyser assay. And so he titrated in a matrix the receptor binding domain and the, and the ACE2 construct together, and he could read signal with his alpha lyser reagents and find a good ratio around four nanomolar of, of each of the two proteins in a one-to-one -one ratio, gave maximal signal. This makes sense. We know this about alpha lyser assays generally, that there's sort of a, an optimal um, concentration, even at a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and, and Quinn could utilize this to show, in line with the data science that we heard about this morning, a really good Z prime, a really good signal to background using lots of positive and negative controls. Um, and, and, and we could ensure that and show that this assay was inhibitable by just taking um, protein constructs, either um, receptor binding domain, the S1 domain, or using ACE2. So um, by using protein that is just the S1 domain from the receptor binding domain without, without the appropriate tag on it, um, it could interrupt and disrupt that, that protein interaction between receptor binding domain and ACE2, and indeed it does. You could use the other protein partner and take soluble ACE2, but with a his tag that, 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 that won't interact with the alpha lysa beads. And again, you can show the ACE2 interrupts and disrupts the interaction between our two proteins that we care about in our proximity assay. And so from there, Quinn moved on to a, a drug repurposing screen, really is proof of concept. I don't think we thought we'd find an FDA approved drug that can interrupt interrupt these, but we pre-incubate our drugs with ACE2 in our 1536 well plates, add the receptor binding domain half, and then add our alpha lyser beads. And so, you know, this would give you a, a positive signal when our two partners are binding. However, if you add drugs um, from our repurposing library, and they do happen to disrupt the ACE2 receptor binding domain interaction, you would get a loss of signal. And so, just as I showed you on the last slide, with our, our protein construct positive controls. Um, and so that was really exciting out, out of that work. And as I said, the counter assay was absolutely critically important for that. Um, we, had, we ended up getting um, hits that were validating, such as um, Coralagan here. Um, this was uh, the, the single, we got 25 hits out of our primary screen that, that, did, that, that looked good. When we um, followed up with those and did reconfirmation assays, we got down to one that interrupted the alpha lyser interaction and, and really didn't, at the, most of those concentrations, touch the counter assay. Um, as I say, I don't think this is a repurposing opportunity from a clinical trial point of view, but it, but it, but it certainly is a useful and has been a useful tool control positive compound for further work that it's been doing. Um, this is the, 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 the plot here, the, the primary assay gave um, a significant number of hits, um, as did the counter assay. There is a relatively high primary hit rate in alpha lyser assays. Um, but using reconfirmation assays on, on these, these hits, we got down initially to 25 and then, then one, um, po another positive control here, here Kangra law, which is, which is shown here, which has been quite useful and, and is not active at, 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 at equal concentrations in the counter assay. The good news is I can, I can skim through this slide. Mitchell just talked about nanobodies as a, as a therapeutic approach. Um, one of the downsides of the way we, we constructed this particular assay is that, as I showed on the previous slide here, um, we're really relying on a, um, a, a, an interaction between the FC domain and, and, and protein A as part of our assay. So we can't evaluate standard Ig-like antibodies in our alpha lyser assay. We could use a nickel hiss interaction in, instead for that alpha lyser bead, um, and, and Quinn's developing that. But for nanobodies, we don't have that, that problem. And so we were able to, to take some of the nanobodies that were, were, were available commercially now and, and that had been developed and, and to compare them in dose response. And you can see that not just small molecules, but, but nanobodies with um, known potency 
um, were tested and, and we got some really, really nice data out of this that, that shows that this assay is useful for supporting nanobody development as well as small molecule development. The second assay that I that I want to tell you a little bit about is a, a biochemical assay for a protease. So the last one was a protein-protein proximity assay. This one was tackled by, by, by John Shrimp in our group. And, and TEMPRIS-2, again, the biology and our understanding is evolving, but TEMPRIS-2 had also previously been shown with other COBs to be a protease that cleaved a specific sequence in the spike protein that facilitated um, viral fusion and, and cell entry. Um, amazingly, in this case, there are two FDA-approved drugs in Japan. They're not TEMPRIS-2 inhibitors by definition. Um, they're trypsin inhibitors that are used for treating pancreatitis. However, it was... Um, had been shown very indirectly in cell-based assays that these compounds could also inhibit TEMPRIS-2 and inhibit the entry of um, other coronaviruses into cells, you know, in the past 15 years. Um, based on that literature, these two drugs uh, had both been in and still are in clinical trials um, as single agents at the moment for treating SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, but there was no primary literature showing that these compounds or these drugs, I should say, inhibit TEMPRIS-2. So John decided to take a, an approach using a, a very standard um, protease assay approach using a, a coumarin conjugated peptide and using a fluorogenic assay where a protease like TEMPRIS-2 would, would cleave a peptide bond, liberating a coumarin that would then become fluorescent. So when the enzyme is active, you get fluorescence. Again, pre-printing and sharing all of our data as quickly as possible, um, but also trying to publish. And again, you can go and take a look at this paper if you want to read about the details. But, but, but John took a very um, standard approach to this. Um, we didn't know much. In fact, one of the biggest challenges and, uh, was, was creating recombinant protein. Our great collaborator up at MCI and Frederick National Labs, Dom Esposito, again, um, did a lot of work trying to make enzyme um, based on what was in the literature. And there was some big reproducibility challenges challenges there. We screen lots of enzyme for activity. We screen lots of peptide substrates to find the optimal fluorogenic peptide substrate. Um, we had to screen for enzyme concentrations to identify an optimal enzyme concentration. We had to screen for buffer pH because we really needed to make sure we were working in the right pH window. Um, we had to then um, generate our michaelis metton um, KM value for our substrate of choice to make sure we selected a a substrate concentration around the, around the KM of our substrate, and then go through 384 well plate, um, positive and negative controls for Z prime and signal to background, and 1536 well plate as we stepped up the the, the density or the the um, of of our of our assay because we really wanted to screen in 1536 well plates and and use dose response. So John did that and um, executed a, a high throughput drug repurposing screen. Um, that works actually unpublished, the, the repurposing screen itself, but it's all there on the open data portal. But what we really wanted to share when we published the assay was the activity of these um, two FDA-approved drugs. And indeed, they are really potent inhibitors. Nefamistat is actually more active, and, and I know that, that this data has helped to some uh, clinical trial decisions that were made. Nefamistat was only just going into human clinical trials when we were getting underway. Um, it also turns out that this molecule, FOY251, is the the primary metabolite of mechamostat, it's, it's, there's a, an ester here that's cleaved uh, to liberate an acid. This is also quite a potent, this primary metabolite, quite a potent inhibitor. That wasn't known or shown. Um, and, and so again, you can see, you can imagine that while the half-life of chemostat is short in vivo, in, in human indeed, um, its primary metabolite is also an inhibitor. And so it's not, and maybe the, the pharmacokinetics need to be reevaluated in that context. So those are just two examples, but this, this open data approach is something that um, has, has been um, gotten a lot of attention this year. Um, there's a preprint on the open data portal itself and the approach we've taken, how we've made that website, how we're sharing all of our data. Uh, people have taken all the data there, such as Tudor Opria, to create um, predictive uh, machine learning and AI-driven platforms for identifying new therapeutic opportunities. Um, and there was a lot of science attention on this open data approach that was particularly satisfying. Um, one of them, as I said here, you can see the link here for Tudor Opria's um, 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 AI-driven approach for trying to identify and develop new um, SARS-CoV-2 medicines. So where are we with, with antivirals? So we've done a lot of drug repurposing screening. Um, a lot of clinical trials have taken place with repurposed drugs. Some of those have shown some promise. There are compounds like chloroquine that we're not going to talk about and hydroxychloroquine that, that, that had an EUA and went away again. 
Um, we could talk for an hour about reproducibility and the importance of reproducibility before um, taking things into, into humans based on and the data quality that you have. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we developed a, and, and rolled out a summit, um, a half day summit focused on antiviral therapeutics and new drugs, where we stand with that and where the science stands. Um, you can watch the video cast of that if you need not to spend four hours this weekend uh, taking a deep dive on antiviral drug development. Um, but I'm just going to give you an update on viral replication machinery, proteases and preclinical tools, because they're most relevant to the assay development and the therapeutic development that we've, we've talked about today. So I'm just going to uh, jump back to this, to, to this screen for a moment. Um, I showed you this scheme a little earlier. It's been updated now, and, and, and I'm sure in the next few weeks and months, we and others are going to be playing around with this, um, this new receptor target that, that, or co-receptor target that, that SARS-CoV-2 seems to uh, need to utilize. Um, but as I said, there are two proteases here, furin and Tempris-2. There's this replication machinery down here um, that's, that's critically important as well. And then there are the viral proteases. So there are host and viral proteases that, to think about. So on the replication machinery side, we're really talking about RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Um, historically, it's been targeted um, from the point of view of antiviral drug development. And there are really five antiviral um, replication machinery inhibitors that are out there in human clinical trials or uh, approved in the case of remdesivir. Uh, molnupiravir, which was called EIDD2801 till recently that came out of Emory and is licensed by Merck. Uh, favipiravir, um, AT527 and, and galadesivir. These last four are all in clinical trials. Um, some of them have some animal data. Um, as you probably noticed, you don't need in vivo activity, antiviral activity to go into human clinical trials. You do need to really make sure you have safety. But something I want to make, po point I would make about all of these new drugs is that um, they're actually all pre-existed SARS-CoV-2 by a, a significant period were developed for other targets and are really repurposing examples. And so if you look at these from Desivir, um, is a nucleotide prodrug. It was actually developed um, broadly for treating RNA viruses, was in clinical trials for Ebola. That failed, but as we saw, it was one of the first drugs tested um, early at the beginning of this year for treating SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, been through clinical trials, shown activity, being approved by the FDA. Of the others, uh, molnupiravir that came out of Emory was developed for influenza, um, and it's really been first in human for clinical trials for, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, favipiravir um, is um, an approved drug in Japan, developed for influenza. Um, so a lot of um, inhuman um, toxic toxicology, toxicity, and dosing experience exists with that one. So that's that's in clinical trials, uh, primarily in Japan, um, and is very in stage three. AT five twenty seven is interesting. It's from a biotech called Atea Pharmaceuticals in Boston, being developed for hepatitis C for the equivalent target in hepatitis C. And they'd shown safety in early clinical trials for hepatitis C, and that's now been pivoted and is in um, phase two, going into phase three clinical trials um, at the moment in the United States. And 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 galadesivir is another interesting one, um, developed for hepatitis C uh, originally, uh, pivoted to some very thankfully rare but lethal viruses like Ebola and Marburg. Um, and um, when when SARS-CoV-2 came around. Um, this was picked up and is actually in clinical trials in Brazil. Uh, now, nucleoside and nucleotide analogs, uh, dosing can be a challenge. Not all of them are orally bioavailable. In fact, uh, the approved one is has to be administered IV. Galadesivir is, is a similar scenario. Um, but I think we'll see some new uh, chemical matter coming out in the next six to 12 months, really focused on and designed around the SARS-CoV-2 RDRP target. The other are host and viral proteases, and it's an interesting parallel story. As I showed you with John's work, um, it's relatively easy to make a recombinant protease um, and to, to get an assay going and do some screening and some medicinal chemistry um, and look for opportunities. In the case of RDRP, there is still not an, uh, uh, the replication machinery. There is still not a straight up biochemical assay that exists from what we can tell. So there's still a lot of assay work to do even while we need to generate these drugs. As I said, for, for proteases, there are host proteases and there are viral proteases, and there's a similar situation. I've already mentioned the Tempris 2 host protease inhibitors, and I think as time goes on, we're going to see some active furin inhibitors as well. We're going to have to need to work out how to combine all of these protease and RDRP inhibitors again, and, and host versus viral targets. For the viral proteases, um, there are quite a few compounds that have come out. Um, only a couple of them are in clinical trials, 
Um, lupinavir was FDA approved for HIV, um, seems to have some activity, um, maybe. Um, isotretinoin um, is actually FDA approved. It has many activities. It's been shown to inhibit the PL protease of um, SARS-CoV-2. We don't know what, what the basis of its um, antiviral activity is, but it's FDA approved. It, it's, it treats acne using a completely different mechanism and there's a lot of work to be done. And there's a Pfizer compound. And then as time gone, has gone on, there's been some newer ones. And I, I think this GC376 compound is very interesting. It was developed by a company to treat feline coronavirus. Don't forget, as I mentioned earlier with camels, when I was asking Mitchell, there are lots of other coronaviruses out there uh, in other animals. That's why we got them, they're zoonotic. Um, and, and this one actually seems to have pretty good activity against the SARS-CoV-2 M protease as well. And um, we could see that going into clinical trials. Um, there are some new proteases inhibitors that are actually developed on target against the SARS-CoV-2 proteases, M pro and, and, and PL pro, and these are fairly early stage. So those pre-existing candidates are out there. And this, this example that Annalise Anderson from Pfizer shared when we put together her her um, overview for her panel discussion on proteases is a really great example. There's a few papers that have come out in the last month or two on, on, on this, this candidate, which is called, it's got a long name, it's got a Pfizer code name, we're gonna call it 814. But in fact, this, this, this molecule, the start point for their drug program this year was actually an inhibitor of the, uh, of the equivalent SARS protease back in 2003 when SARS was a problem. SARS was resolved with public health measures there were no vaccines, there were no drugs developed against it. And when it went away, I guess it's understandable that the, the drug development programs went away as well. So Pfizer early this year dusted off this over 15 year old program, looked at this chemical matter and assessed what they needed to do. Um, they, they, they made sure it was active against the SARS-CoV-2 protease, it was. They had to make sure it was active in cell-based models using Vero cells initially, it was. Um, they had some structural biology work that they managed to get together on that, but the pharmacokinetics was poor. And so they actually decided to make a prodrug where they phosphorylated this. So it's a, a single chemical change compared to the original candidate that they dusted off called 231, phosphorylated it. So it needs to be injected IV, but it's got a much longer half-life. Um, it's this, this phosphate is, is cleaved in blood plasma, liberating the active drug. And so they could go on to, to show with their new candidate that it was active in cells, human-based cell lines, active in vivo, and it was dosed in the first, first patient in a phase one clinical trial in September. So this is an amazing, you know, 10 months, nine months story from Pfizer to go from molecule to clinical trial. But keep in mind, a lot of work was done over 15 years ago and Pfizer kept that unpublished and were able to reactivate and, and get a potentially useful clinical candidate. So that was a great story that came out of that. The last few slides I've got here are just touching on this assay and preclinical tools section that we had. And I think we have a long way to go. One thing we know from organizing the summit, from reading the literature, talking to each other, no, no two labs in the United States are running the same assays for um, assessing SARS-CoV-2 antiviral activity. It's very difficult, very fragmented. Um, Cell-based infection assays are quite different. Um, there are a few different ones that are available. The cytopathic effect is very common. Uh, immunostaining using high content assay approaches has also been utilized by quite a few labs. Um, Peyong Shi, who, who hosted this uh, preclinical tool session, had actually engineered the live virus, it's still a BSL3 live virus, with a luciferase, He's, in this case with nano luciferase. So he could take, um, he also made a fluorescent version, but he could take this luciferase engineered, well, genome engineered virus incubated with cells. In his case, he was looking for um, 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 cell entry uh, inhibition, neutralizing antibody assessment, but for small molecules, he can do this as well. The cells become infected, they translate the luciferase, you get a signal. So there's been some assay innovation that's taken place this year as we need to try and find ways to scale and automate these assays. But the cell line that you put into that plate is also absolutely critical. So we've got how we measure antiviral activity and the, the cell line tools that we're using and a really good example of that is remdesivir. It's really active in these KLU3 human lung cell lines. It's really quite weak in these Vero E6 cells, which are monkey kidney cells. They're not very relevant from a species point of view anyway. And we know they express a lot of drug transporter and it turns out remdesivir is pumped by drug efflux transporters. So this is a far more relevant cell line that's reflective of the activity we see of the, for this drug against human airway epithelial cells. 
Um, there are multiple reasons for that. Remdesivir needs to be metabolized um, to make this um, nucleoside triphosphate active metabolite. That's true for all of those RDRP inhibitors that, that I showed you a few slides ago. But decisions have to be made around how easy it is to grow a cell line, how scalable that cell line is. And, and so we love working with things like H293s and KCO2s, and they're very popular, um, but they may not be the most relevant. Lung-derived models are really, really relevant. Um, and of course, primary models, tissue bioprinted models um, are, are really what people are working on now to try and create the most relevant tools for studying SARS-CoV-2, but thankfully they're cell-based tools that will be available for studying other respiratory viruses as well, like influenza. And of course, there are animal models, and I'm not going to read this slide out. I, I put it in here so people can hit pause when they're, they're watching the recording of this. There are, there are references here, but as mouse, Syrian hamster, ferret are quite popular, I suspect mink would be a really great model, but um, unfortunately, it's also presented a lot of challenges because the virus moves through that species so quickly. And non-human primates, and we have a page at the NCATS Open Data Portal that we developed with the NIH Active Program. Um, you can see the link there. Carl's put a QR code in here, which is great. And, and that's got very detailed information about every single animal model that's being used for SARS-CoV-2 protocols that are available for them. Again, just like with in vitro, just like with cell-based or biochemical assays, reproducibility of animal models is absolutely critical for translational science. And so we created this resource here on the Open Data Portal so that people can, can, can make decisions about the best models to use or not. So I think that, you know, the really interesting thing about this year has been that there's never been a spotlight on translational science, on assay development, on drug development, the way there has this year. Um, no one knew in the average household about a clinical trial hold until this year. But what we've learned is a lot. Assays are important and assays are critical to effective discovery of, of, of clinical candidates. That's been true for everything this year from vaccines to neutralizing antibodies to small molecule antivirals. You know, our translational science model works well. Developing assays and performing drug repurposing screen is important. And we can really break some of those entrenched challenges. You know, it was easy to get our biologists and our informaticians to share the data we were generating as soon as we developed it and not go through the painful traditional process of writing the manuscript and getting peer reviewed. And 18 months later, we published the paper. And um, after, as soon as I finish here, our scientific director, Dr. Anton Simonov is gonna speak and we're about to, to co-publish a, a paper in PNAS on a, a Zika protease inhibitor. That takes four years. It takes a long time to do some of this science, but being able to stop everything and focus has been really important really important and valuable for us. And of course, assays are important for more than early discovery. And I, I, I name dropped, you know, serology assays earlier on at their ELISAs. Usually there's a lot of opportunities for assay optimization and for automation of, of clinical assays that we don't normally often think about in, in this circle. So with that, I've got a huge list of names here, but I just want to thank all of you for uh, listening this long. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the assay guidance manual. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your time.